Hello everyone, I'm Bien, and uh, welcome to our session today. I'm a senior business analyst, and uh, the presentation is entitled Stop Writing User Stories and Start Doing Analysis. Hans Ekman has proven you can turn mild ADD, OCD, and other personality disorders into a successful career. He shares his life simplification tips at conferences throughout the US and Canada and on his website. At SunTrust Bank, he established three different centers of excellence and a successful security services delivery team. Hans currently serves as a principal consultant at Blueprint Software Systems, helping drive business transformation and delivery excellence. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Hans. Thank you. So thanks so much for coming here. Um, I want this to be a very interactive, engaging uh, presentation. So there's some information. Uh, again, I apologize and full credit to Cole for developing this. He had a conflict and wasn't able to make it, so we've been filling in on some of his sessions. And this one actually is his contact, so uh, his contact information's at the end if you have questions. But I want this to be a discussion. I want you to share your stories as we go through this. So as we jump in, um, so one of the struggles we have is Agile was supposed to solve all of our problems. And if we just wrote some simple stories and focused in on what we do, we would be guaranteed success, right? Is, everyone, is there anyone here who is completely successful by just writing simple user stories and suddenly all of the problems in our organizations have gone away? All right, so that's what we're going to focus in on is the problem with what we're seeing with Agile and Agile adoption now is less about Agile and more about how it's being implemented or the fact that we're trying to take analysis out of it. So one of the things, even Agile, like who is the business analyst in an Agile team? Okay, so we've got a few people. Are you called the business analyst? No. You actually are? So you have an Agile team that actually recognizes a business analyst? Awesome! Because when you look at the Agile model, there's no BA. You've got product owners, you've got all these different roles. So in a way, everyone needs to be the analyst. And one of the big problems we've had is the analysis work isn't getting done in Agile projects. So there's a few things we're gonna learn here today. One is we're gonna talk about why a lot of user stories are failing, um, how we can use analysis to drive better stories, and the last, again, I wanna talk about the challenges and the situations you're having to make this as real and applicable to you as possible. So, how many people have ever written or seen the system shall requirements? The system shall blank, the system shall blank. I can probably say in my entire career, I have never written these words, and I have aggravated a ton of people who have used them because I think if you're writing this, it's horrible, like you've already lost the battle. Because what we're doing is, we're simply trying to create this little template and fill in the blank. If we just say the system shall do this, and the system shall do that, everything will work out, right? just like if we write a user story. So when we get to it, we end up having these long documents with the system shall this, the system shall this, the system shall this. What are we kind of forgetting if that's all we're writing? What it should be. What? What it should be. Okay, so what it should be. So we're, we're, if we're talking about the system, so we're saying this should do something. So we've got a piece of that. What else are we missing? What the user. What the user. There's no user, there's no reason. Is everything just the system doing things? Um, what about your non-functional requirements? What about your data requirements? The system shall have a data requirement that states blank. I mean, you get this ugly, horrible mess when you do it that way. So Agile's much, much better. Instead of saying the system shall, we say, as a blank user, I want to blank for some blank. Completely better than, a, than system shall, isn't it? Like, this is a much better format. At least now we have a user. We're saying what the user wants to do, and we're saying why. So we've solved all our requirements problem. This is all we need, right? What's wrong here? We still need a conversation. Okay, there's got to be a conversation. So what am, I, what am I really saying here in a story? If I write a story in this format, what is the only thing I've really stated? Okay, we've, we've identified a person. Yeah. Okay, so good. We've added value. So in the system shall statement, we never talked about what the value, the goal, or the outcome. At least here, we're stating what the reason is. Um, and then we're kind of saying that they want to do something. 
So that middle part might be. But then we run into the same situation. And how many times were we getting trapped on these projects? Where oh, now I'm saying the system shall blank. A user shall blank for blank. A user shall blank for blank. A user for now go implement those stories. And we're really we're missing the context. We're missing the reasons. We're missing everything that's going on. And instead, we're creating this long, horrible list, thinking that we're marching ahead and we're faster and we're agile and we've got these sprints and we know our sprint timings. And really, we've created this evil empire of horrible <laughs> user stories where we think the story is all that matters. Now, a story is important because a story is giving us a context. It's giving us a frame. It's acting as the center of our universe. So when we're doing projects, I always like to figure out what's the central focus? What is everything going to revolve around? For me, typically it's a process. I always focus everything around process flows because if you understand the process flow, for me it's a lot easier to decompose and understand what needs to happen. In Agile, it's the user story. Everything is user story centric. So in order to have this user story work, what are all the things that are going around it? The problem is, is we're missing all the things around it. Um, in, a, in a very graphical system, I tend to do everything screen-based because I think it's easier to tell the story in screens. So looking at Forrester, despite the adoption of agile practices, organizations can struggle to deliver quality. They have numerous points of failure when they cannot meet delivery commitments, and poor or missing requirements are a significant source of delays or rework. Do we agree with their findings? Yes. Are we experiencing the same thing? What would you guess, so if we just took a look at any project, how, what percentage of projects actually deliver the intended business value? What would we guess? 20%. 20%. I have a vote of 20%. Anybody want to go higher, higher, 30, 30, 35, 35, 40, 40%? 40 Anyone want to say 40%? 50%? It's actually 50%. So half of all projects deliver the intended business value, which means if you went through your organization and randomly killed half of your projects, <laughs> you might actually help the business out because all the other would be waste. Now the key is what happens if you cut the good half might not be as helpful. So looking at some more reporting data, 96% of respondents reported missing requirements as a key problem. 88% said that they're experiencing missing requirements at least on a quarterly basis. So we've got a big gap. And it's not just, like a lot of times when we talk about defects and we talk about testing, we're talking about finding things on the back end. But really, we've got a huge cause of problems where if we're not doing the requirements up front, where it's cheap, it's very inexpensive to make a mistake on paper. It gets very, very expensive to start making mistakes in code. And if you want to find the absolute most expensive place to test your requirements, it's your customers. And if you don't believe me, ask Equifax and Target. They're experiencing exactly how expensive it is to put out defects into production. So looking at uh, organizations that need a robust agile requirement solution, 88% said that they needed a strong traceability to connect requirements, user stories, and delivery capabilities. So what they're saying is, 88% is saying those stories aren't enough. We need to trace, we need to know where this is going. You may hear the term biz ops or biz dev ops or dev ops. These are all attempts to bring the teams together to work so that the team that's building in and managing the changes knows exactly who they're working with and why those changes are important. And 82% want a data visualization feature. So another shift is it's not just about the story of what I can do, but it's how do I represent that information in a visible format so that I can make it more usable. Thoughts or comments on either of those two? Does it sound believable? It's very true. Think it's yeah. true? Yeah. I hope so. Like, I don't know. Cole could have made this slide up. <laughs> we'll assume that it's good. And since it's very pretty, I'm assuming that he also pulled it from somewhere reputable. Um, but I don't have a citation and apologize for that, so you'll have to email Cole for it. So another exciting, brightly colored slide. Accounting for all requirements produces tangible benefits. 65% would benefit from improved internal collaboration and 60% expect increased customer satisfaction. Now this is one of those, you're kind of like, well, of course. Like every day I'm trying to work with you and you don't have time on your schedule, you don't think it's important. Yet if you then ask them saying, well, what's the single greatest influence is, well, if we work better together, we would get better results. That was the focus in why Agile is so powerful when we lose the perception of it, is Agile is about teams first. 
that if a team worked well together, they could produce more, produce better. And taking that team approach was supposed to be the driving factor, not just saying a user will be able to blank in order to blank. That wasn't the purpose of teams. We've basically taken a team methodology and now turned it into a system shall universe. And system shall fail when you do that. So how do we clean this up? Oh, it's easy. Let's add an acronym and a whole new way of doing it. So let's use invest. Let's make sure that they're independent, negotiable, valuable, estimatable, small, and testable. How many people do smart requirements and no smart? <laughs> this is Agile Smart, but Agile doesn't isn't smart, it invests, so it's catchy. It's kind of like our education program, no child left behind. That's awesome. Who wants to leave children behind? <laughs> like it seems like pretty obvious now how it actually works. Eh, there's some children being left behind. Not so good. So when we look at this, then we're starting to potentially add band-aid. So is there anything here that is wrong? Like, is there any reason why we wouldn't follow these criteria? Like, it kind of makes sense. Like, it makes sense to have these information, this information to tie it in. But it all ties into the reason we have these things is you've got to have discrete requirements. If you don't have discrete requirements, what are you doing? What are you testing? It's not just a story. Like, if I said our story is we are going to be, we want to be able to have, be the first people in line at the buffet so we get choice of the food before it either gets cold or runs out. That's a pretty easy story to follow. Now, if I started asking each one of you how we would do that, how many different answers are we going to If I ask 10 people, how many different answers am I going to get? 10. No, 15. Because <laughs> you know how you all work. You didn't participate right from this morning. Because everybody, you know, you're going to get more ideas than you, or more options than you even have people. We're all going to do it differently, and that's again where the user story is failing. And the whole thought was, oh, well, we just want these high-level stories so that the d designers and developers could then iteratively play around and code stuff until we found out what works. So the purpose of Agile was to take the work away from the analysis give it to developers so that they could build whatever they wanted, and instead of building something that would fail, we fail very, very smallly, so we'll just keep building stuff until we randomly hit what you're looking for. <laughs> How many of us feel that that's the situation we're in? Yeah, and as a, as a developer, or as a part of a team, isn't that kind of a cool way to work? You mean I show up to work every day, I randomly do something, or do something that I think is fun, I'll see if you like it. If you don't like it, then I'll put it into the next sprint and I'll do something different. So I can't fail because my whole purpose is to just give you stuff to react to. I never have to deliver anything. <laughs> I'm starting to really like this idea. Um, I always told people, if you want a, your documentation to match your system, don't write it at the beginning of the project, write it at the end. Go ahead and document what you already put in and it'll match a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so our user story is independent. What do we think? Can you, are, are stories independent? They're supposed to be? Who thinks that independent, each story should be independent and, and discrete? Okay, so independent meaning stands on its own regardless of what any other story says. Should it be, should it be decomposed to the level where a story stands on its own, like it may have supporting information, but this story and another story don't have to work together. So the stories need to work together? Okay. So, from Jane Hirschfield, everything is connected, everything changes, so pay attention. So yes, to a certain extent, if you have the same story spread across multiple stories, or a story referencing another story, Perhaps that's a little hard to understand. But what's the main purpose of a story? What's the main purpose of a story or requirement, anything you're doing? Why do we even bother doing it if the developers already know what they want to code? What's, what's the sole purpose with coming up with a way of writing and uh, writing requirements? To connect it to the goals. Okay, so it's got to be connected to the goal. Capture user needs. Who cares about the goal? Who cares about the user need? Why are we docu why do we bother documenting anything? That's what Agile says. 
Yeah. <laughs> Same reason we stop for red lights. Same reason why, it, you know, there's a, uh, a, just down the street here, we were going down to Gastown, and there's a sign that said, you must obey all traffic signals, dangerous intersection. Oh, yeah. Every Canadian is stopped at there, and I'm walking right through because there's no cars. And they're just shocked, like, oh my word, you disobeyed a sign. I'm like, but the, no, I don't take that sign seriously. The whole purpose of why we document is to communicate to, between multiple people. If I already know, I don't need to document. But if I need you to have the same understanding that I have, we have to have something put down on paper that we can react to and, and come to the same understanding. More arguments, more issues, more challenges throughout our lives, I believe, come from two people thinking they have the same understanding and they really don't. And that's why we're doing all this work. We don't do user stories just to do user stories. We do user stories because we need an entire team to agree on what it is we're trying to do, what we're going to accomplish, how we're going to accomplish it, when we're going to accomplish it, and are there any constraints. So, is everything really negotiable? What do we think? Cole's challenging us here. Yes. Okay. Yes, why? Yes, why? Okay. So if we're doing anything, there's no absolute truth, and how did we get it right? So, by nature, there should be, there could be negotiation in it. Okay. Unless it is supposed to match the legislation or policy. Okay, so if it's something that is dictated, compliance or how you do that might be a lot less negotiable, or would be only negotiable on certain levels, like the how might be, but the thou shalt do it is mandated. Absolutely. How many people work in a highly regulated area, just out of... Okay, more than half, absolutely. So you live in kind of the extreme version of this world. Um, if we're working in something that's not very regulated, we've got a lot more flexibility. When we get into highly regulated, everything matters to such a degree that we then get bogged down. So, Alistair Cockburn, a requirement is about your relationship to a decision. If it's a des your decision to make, then it's design. It's not a requirement. So let's think about what he has to say. He's basically saying if you are deciding how something is going to be done, you're not writing a requirement, you're doing design. How many times have we gotten into a fight or an argument with a development team who's mad that we're doing design in the requirements and you're telling them, no, these are requirements, this is how it has to work? Well, what he's saying is basically if you're telling them how it has to work, you've just done design. Do we agree with that? What do we think? Yeah. It's pretty potent. Now, is there something wrong with doing design? Yeah, so it's not a question. Design has to happen. But developers tend to think that design only happens at the design pre-coding stage. There is design that's going to fit into at the system and the functional level. There's design that has to happen at the business level. You're designing how you want something to do. If not, what you would do is your business person would say, here's a goal I would like to accomplish. You would say, here are the constraints around accomplishing that goal, and here's generally how it needs to fit in. And then somebody down the road will say, and here's how I will accomplish this goal in these constraints, and I will only do design at the end. It's nice, but that's just not reality. So being aware that we are doing design decisions. Um, I got a boss that I used to get into big arguments with this because he hated the way I did documentation. Because I always started at the business level and the goals and decomposed down to the functional level. That's what I believe doing. He's like, but why would you do that? Because then it's leaving things open to interpretation. He wrote requirements documents that were pure system level design. So it was the instructions for how to code this. And I'm like, okay, then you've made all the decisions and I hope you were right because you didn't document anything so we have no way of checking, either your design's gonna work, basically you just did extreme programming, only you told people what to go extremize. <laughs> yes, I made that word up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how valuable is a user story? From our great friend Cole in the one picture where he's not wearing a bow tie. Software is only, as value, is only valuable to the business when it gives the benefit that they expect it. What do you think about Cole's comment here? was important enough that he quoted himself. So all this software comes to picture and uses for the question analysis. 
Okay, so, so that. How valuable is the user story and the software is valuable? Okay, so he's making the assumption that you're only writing user stories to produce software, so very IT focused. So, is software only value if it gives you your intended benefit? So let's first take this for what he's going for here, which is, if I program in and, and add features, if I do stuff, but it's not giving me the business value I'm going after, am I getting value out of that? So it's maybe, maybe not, but I'm making a decision to spend work effort to add things that the business doesn't want, therefore they're not valuable to the business unless you convince them that they want it. Think about your remote control at home. Does anyone have like a Fire TV, Fire Stick, one of the basic streaming devices, Roku? So you've got a, there's four, maybe five buttons on the darn remote. It's like click, 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 easy, it works all the time. Now look at the remote that came with your home entertainment system or your TV. That is the difference between a business designed, UX designed remote and one that was designed by engineers. Engineers look and say, well, sometimes I want to skip ahead 30 seconds, sometimes I want to skip ahead two minutes. I have room for both buttons. I will add a button for each. Maybe I want to jump all the way to the eject disk and switch over to TV. I will add a button for that. So you add all these things, and that's kind of the problem we get into when we push all of the design and the decisions is, in an essence, yes, it is true. We've got to focus in on why the business needs something. What is the value? If not, what we're producing isn't aligned to them, and they may think they got something, but it wasn't what they wanted. Even if it is better, even if it adds value, even if it helps the same customer base, you've got to get their buy-in on what you're doing, that it adds that value, and get that alignment ahead of time. So how estimatable are your user stories? From Steve McConnell. When executives ask for an estimate, they are often asking for a commitment or a plan to meet the target. What do we think about this? How many times do we go, or do we have project managers in here? Okay, a few. Close your ears, you're going to hate this part. <laughs> hey, I've laid out this plan. Here's the structure of the project. Here's how it's going to do. How much effort is going to take for this, for this, for this? Oh, that doesn't fit into my plan. You need to do 40 hours of work in 20 hours, or we're not going to hit our deadline because I stretched this out. If you are curious about that and want to read a really good book, it's a little intense. Um, Eliahu Goldway, and I always mispronounce his name, so apologies. Theory of constraints. And basically, it's a real easy concept. Use you as an example, because you've participated well so far. I'm going to ask you for an estimate, and you generally think it's going to take you 10 hours to complete. How many hours are you going to tell me it takes to complete? I'll double it. Double it? Double, maybe triple. Okay, double to triple depending on the risk or the complexity. So we know all know that it's only going to take 10 hours. You're now saying you're going to give me an estimate of 20 to 30 hours. How many people would agree with that? Say that probably if they're given an estimate, the estimate's going to be 20 to 30 hours. How many hours is your project manager or your scrum master now going to put in for that item? If you're getting a 30-hour estimate, how much time are you going to allocate? 30%. <laughs> You're gonna, so 60, you're going to go the other direction, which says, hey, if somebody said it's going to take them 30, I know everything takes twice as long, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to be safe and estimate 30. Anyone going to say 20, take 50% away? What about 15? And say they probably doubled the estimate, so what they probably mean is 15. Or you really don't trust them and you're going to make up your own estimate anyway, and you say 5 or 10. So here's where the theory of constraints comes in. Everybody lies. <laughs> and we have to. Because what happens, what happens when we give this estimate of 10 hours? Let's say he goes with a realistic estimate. He's, new, he's a newbie, new to the company, hasn't worked on a project, so he's like, yeah, it'll actually take me 10 hours. If it takes him 20 hours, what is he going to do? He's going to work that time and not report it because he doesn't want to be proven that it took him twice as much as he agreed or everyone else thought it. Because who wants to look incompetent? What happens if it only takes him two hours because he figures a genius way of solving it and didn't have to do all the work and now he can solve it in two hours instead of ten? 
Is he going to report two hours? Maybe, no. Maybe no. once in his life, but not again. <laughs> because then, every time you give a 10-hour estimate, the PM is going to say it was two, because that's what happened before. So instead, you're going to report 10 so that your estimates look well, and then you're going to play online for eight hours. <laughs> or you're going to use it to pad another area where it will go over. So the whole theory of constraints is you are piling lie upon lie upon lie upon lie, dividing by lie, adding lie back in, doubling lie, and why don't our projects finish on time? It just doesn't make any sense. But that's where this... Theory, that's where the theory of constraints comes in. Um, he's got some solutions on how to fix it, but honestly, I don't remember because. I just, just lie. It's all lie. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, the user stories aren't supposed. You're not. You never estimated user stories in hours. It's relative size points. You don't put it in hours. Okay. How do you do it in? How do you do it in agile? So how how do you play poker? Play poker, okay, so what do you do, in, so instead of hours, you're using what to estimate? Story points. Story points, okay. And what does a point represent? It doesn't represent anything, it's relative to all the stories within your project. Okay, so it's a relative point measure, and how do you decide how many points go into a sprint? The team decides. So the team randomly decides that if they want to put 100 points into this week's sprint, 20 points into next week's sprint, 35 into the sprint after that, no points into the Halloween, into the Thanksgiving sprint. Oh, sorry, Canadian, wrong Thanksgiving. Um, end of the year, New York, New Year's. We're going to take that week off, so we're going to put no. So they're allowed. So you're allowed to put as many points as you want week by week. There's no general standardization of what the team's throughput is. Depends on their velocity. Depends on their capacity. Okay, so I have capacity, and I have velocity. Velocity is how, mu how many points I can do over a period of time. Capacity is how many resources I have to do the work. So between how much, how many points I can do and how many points I, I uh, how many people I have to work on points determines. So a point is a representative of work effort. Yeah. So basically Agile hid work effort and called them points because points were easier to deal with. It's like, if I gave everyone a dollar here, what have I given you? A piece of paper. Think about that. Not in Canada. Actually, a coin. <laughs> Good point. So, if I have given you a loony, I have given you a piece of metal that has been stamped and certified by a group. But we all accept the trade value, it represents the trade value of goods and services. So, I might be loony, I might be only worth a certain number of loonies to you in this room, and then I can exchange that for loony things that you can do, and then we have this ecosystem. That's what the ecosystem for Agile is, is we've created a point system. But the problem is by calling them points, we're forgetting the theory of constraints. Because I can lie on points and velocity just as much. Now, Agile checks that because every time you do a retrospective, every time you do a sprint, you rebalance your velocity and you, you're supposed to adjust your points. But you still have the fraud baked into the system, which is the points that you're estimating for different areas. So it's there. I'm just saying recognize it so that you can deal with it and then play the poker game well. Yes, sir? One more fact on this image is uncertainty. And typically with uh, the estimate, you would rather, if your uncertainty is large, then your range is large. So instead Absolutely. of giving a single value, give a range. Yep. And just like with points, your point will vary with your uncertainty. Yep. So you could double your points, mm -hmm. yep. which wouldn't double your time, but it doubles your uncertainty. Yeah. Absolutely. That's great. So if you've got a lot of uncertainty, you've got a point range. You've got a less sure sprint that's happening. So how does Agile really get around the theory of constraints? How does Agile solve this problem of estimates and velocity and points on a sprint by sprint by sprint basis? So we've already established if I do a waterfall project, everybody has built up this stack of lies that creates this super long time frame that may or may not represent what really happens because we've got all this uncertainty hidden in false estimates. How does Agile solve that problem or attempt to solve that problem? Okay, shorten the time periods. So the, the damage a constraint can do is on a smaller time scale, therefore the risk is low. What's the second?
thing. What happens sprint by sprint by sprint that changes and allows you to counteract? You read the this. You're constantly rebalancing your velocity, your capacity, and your estimation. So as you drive out uncertainty, <laughs> your point range drills down. And the second thing it does is instead of punishing people and saying, you're not going to work for eight hours because you got it done in two, instead it says, do more work. And if it takes you longer, I'm going to move some of that work into the next sprint. So it gives you an escape. It gives you the ability to say, I told you this was going to take 10 hours or it was going to be two points. It's actually four points or 20 hours. I'm going to need to break this over two sprints. It gives us a way out. It removes or lessens the constraint where I'm trying to always be right. OK, so how small should a user's story be? Ursula Le Guin. And I don't know how to pronounce her name. Life looks very simple when you leave out all the details. <laughs> Boy, if there was ever a quote for our projects. So when we're looking at our projects, when we're looking at the level of detail, if we're just writing stories, and then I'm thinking the only thing I do is stories, then we run into this false question of how small does a story need to be? Well, if I write a story small enough, it's going to look a lot like the system shell. And then I'm trying to write requirements in a user story. Instead, recognize that the user story is the high level, and there's got to be supporting information behind it. That's where the analysis comes in. And on the Agile teams, we've all got to participate in the analysis. And one of the keys is, how does that analysis work? It comes in doing these sprints and iterations. Is, I'm going to figure something out, we're going to try it out, you're going to react to it, and then we're going to make it better. So I drive out uncertainty, I drill down to this level of detail in small chunks, going and figuring out what I need to do, how is it going to work, and then that's how I learn. And that way I'm reducing my risk dramatically step by step by step. So, can, can we really test every user story? No. Why can't we test every user story? Depends on the story. What are, what's an example of a story or a situation that couldn't be tested? Usually technical user stories. Okay, what's a technical user story? Um, a story that does not typically fit to the uh, template, but is a supporting task to be able to facilitate. Yeah. Okay, so a requirement masquerading as a user story that is really a requirement or a constraint, it's not testable, but then again, it's also not a real user story. Absolutely. <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, when you hide, I mean, but that's the perfect example. Here's an example of I'm doing the system shell. I'm trying to put a non-functional requirement, for example, into a user story basis. Like, a user wants the system to be available between these hours so that they can complete a transaction. Instead of just saying, I have non-functional requirements. System must be online, or the online hours or peak capacity is during these hours. It needs to support this many maximum users at any given time. Why put that in a story? You don't need it. Other, let's challenge us. Other times when a story isn't testable. So I think we hit on the big thing. If you're calling something a story that's not really a story, or it's a bad story, it's probably not going to be testable, but then it shouldn't really be a story yet either. Um, if our goals are too high, if our goals are too vague, if they don't fit the invest criteria, then they're not testable, not because a user's story isn't testable, but it's not valid because the requirement itself, the user story itself, isn't ready. It's not ready to test. It's not valid on its own. Um, I had a, when we implemented static testing at a bank, um, which is basically having the testing team review the requirements to make sure they're smart, they had been decomposed properly, and they were ready to go. So we started doing this with both business and system requirements. On the system requirement side, after a few iterations, it was working really well. We were never able to implement static testing on business requirements. And here's why. There was a lack of understanding of how you test a business requirement that was the problem. So a business requirement, a high-level requirement would be um, user, you know, user needs the ability to change their passcode whenever they need to. So that makes sense. 
And then my system requirements, my functional requirements, and my non-functional will set all the rules. It has to be these constraints. I can only do it this many times. Whatever our security guidelines pop up. But our test team was trying to be literal. So they look at that and they say, well, I can't test that. Like, it's not discrete. It's not testable. So they, every time, every business requirement was failing testing. And finally, we just gave up. Because when you're testing business requirements, you're testing it as an acceptance criteria. You're testing it as a user story. Was, I a, was a certain profile, a certain actor, a certain role able to complete a certain goal with whatever value they did? did were they able to accomplish their mission? So there's a million ways they could do that. Could they do it? That's the high level testing. We also had literal translations like we had one where um, the user slash actor um, will be able to change their login. Failed. Impossible to divide user by actors. No, no, that's slash, not divide. <laughs> Sometimes you get a little lost in translation. <laughs> so when we look at Agile, or now the big push is for SAFE, where we're trying to take these small teams, link these teams together into larger initiatives, and put this into a whole framework where we can create iterations of potentially 50 teams working together where their, inter where their development needs to interact and their systems need to work, that's what SAFE is trying to solve. I'm going to not make a comment on that. Um, but when you look at it, and what SAFE's trying to fill in is basically they're saying, we have this gap. If you're doing just Agile and only writing user stories, look at all the stuff you're leaving out. That's important. The user story is still the theme, it's still the goal, but you've got to decompose. There's got to be supporting information, and you've got to figure out how you're going to do it. If you're in a small and informal team, it could be everyone stands up in the morning, and they just explain it, and somebody goes does it, and you're not really documenting it. Okay, you can do that. As you get more complex, more regulated, um, more distributed teams, even though teams aren't supposed to be distributed, then you've got to document more. You've got more contingencies. You've got more work you have to do. Okay? So I think we've kind of hit on this, but uh, Cole wants us to refresh. User stories are not requirements. It's not saying what's going to happen. It's the why. It, it would be equivalent to our business requirements. Very important, very useful, but we don't want to confuse them. Helping our teams learn this is one of your biggest challenges. It is going to be an ever-pressing fight, especially if you have agile purists, I mean developers, <laughs> convincing them that you just can't give them stories and they get to come up with whatever they want. That's where the teamwork and the partnership, that's where the relationship building needs to come in. So I don't want you to get caught into, as a user, I want something, I want something, I want something, I want something. And this is all your requirements. There's no analysis in this. There's no constraints. You're missing the value. You're letting missed requirements get into production that are going to cause unforeseen or sometimes foreseen difficulties. So we've got to get away. We've got to break people in this habit. Because look at all the things we're missing. The business value. What do the stakeholders think about it? Where does the story fit into our process? What are the data requirements and data constraints we have to worry about? What rule, what are the rules uh, for non-functionals that the story must follow? Are they reusable non-functions? Are they enterprise standards? What does the solution look like? I think there's one more, yep. How will we know if we've been successful implementing our stories? All of these things need to be part and built into our story. In the old days, we would write a requirements approach. We would lay out how we were going to define these things, when we're going to review them, what level of detail we're going to go to, how do we know when we've gone wide enough or deep enough. We need to start putting this into our processes, into our sprints. It is absolutely okay to have a sprint that is nothing but a planning sprint. A whole sprint to figure out how you're going to approach and how you're going to do this and how you're going to communicate and how you're going to work together. Because it's not always the same. And even if we put it into a system where we've got all of these stories linked and we've got the change of stories and we have alternate stories, this is just the highest level. We're still missing that level of detail. We've got to put the analysis back into Agile and into our projects because it's the analysis that is driving what it is we're trying to do. It's our discovery process. 
and we get tied up saying, well, you're a business analyst, a system analyst, or you're a project manager, or a product owner, and you can't do analysis. We've got to teach people that we're all analysts. We have different perspectives, but we're doing this anal anal uh, analysis together, and in Agile more than ever before. This is how we're working it out. So when I'm doing design, I'm doing analysis to see if this design will meet these needs and did we miss any constraints. So at each opportunity in this hierarchy, I have an opportunity to do analysis and to figure out what's going on. Um, so Cole's information in his LinkedIn profile, again, the two pictures he put in doesn't have a, his signature bow tie. So disappointed in him. <laughs> um, but what I want to do is open this up and talk a little bit about the analysis in Agile Projects issues you're having. We've got some time, so I want to take this time to really apply this to your worlds, your universes, even places where you want to challenge. This is Cole's content, so you can absolutely challenge it, and I'll tell him, eh, he missed one. <laughs> so what are, some of the, what are some of the challenges, what are some of the issues, or what are some of the takeaways from this that you might be able to apply? Is there a different way of thinking, is there something you've seen? Yes? Because if not, I'm just using, I'm becoming a document zombie all over again. Yes. Only this time I'm filling, and now I have three blanks to fill in instead of the system shell one blank. So I've gone from one blank to three. <coughs> We've got to agree what the story is, what level we're going to write a story, and how do we support the information. If you're doing something that's system based, it becomes a lot easier. Because then anything, any <coughs> supporting details can go in here. Um, how many people have had experience with use cases? Okay, most of the people. So a use case is probably the best example of what a user story would look like if it was mature and grown up, grown up and actually finished college. <laughs> because it has a high level statement that's part of an overall flow because a use case goes from flow to flow to flow. Each use case is connected and I have a use case diagram that maps them out. Here's my user story diagram. But in the description of the user story, I always had all the supporting information that said, here's the constraints, here's when it's going to happen, here's the alternate flows, here's my alternate steps. So I built in the, so the thought with users, uh, use cases was, I can do a story that has a happy path, the, the ideal, and all the supporting requirements that would make that happen. And Agile made it a little simpler. And we said, we just need the high level story because if you tell us the constraints, we don't get to program what we want. And we really want the freedom to program. This is why I don't do this at developers' conferences. <laughs> Actually, I love developers. And, and when you're doing, when you're flushing out these details, at first there's resistance. But think about it. Have, think about the relationships you've had with developers, which suddenly realize that if you're telling them the constraints up front, and you're open to suggestions where I have a design constraint, could we change how this works because it would be a lot easier? That dialogue, when you build those relationships, is powerful. And it's infectious. And that's how it gets to a team. Yesterday we had a gentleman who was talking about how um, they're a scrum master. And on all the teams they had built this team harmony and work and everything was going well. And now they're stuck on a team and it just doesn't have that. They haven't built the trust. They haven't built the relationship. They haven't come to terms with the fact that they're trying to do stories but not with all the information or the wrong people are doing the wrong work and that's a team building, that's a trust building issue. It's not an agile issue. It's not even a requirements issue. It's a team issue of trusting and getting people to do what they want. So fantastic comment. Yes? There is a saying something about data. What data does the use for you? Yep. Do, do you support that? Um, when you're doing your user stories, no matter how simple it is, draw the ERD diagram. If there's the two entities, you have to show the relationship that it grows as you write more user stories. I, um, I like that, absolutely. So 
this is where it comes into. So the whole purpose of documenting is to communicate between two people. So if tying um, uh, uh, your storyline to an ERD diagram, if that's what your organization works well with, absolutely do that. Other areas, maybe the data modelers get a little finicky. So instead what you do is you describe the information you need and any relationships between information and then they put it into the model in the ERD diagram and create the relationship. So you could say, I need first name, middle name, surname, all these things. So you're telling what I need, but then they decide how they want to structure it, how they want to relate, rather than if you say, well, here's my ERD diagram. So I'm telling you I've got a table of personal contacts and a table of addresses and a table of phone numbers. And they're like, no, we already have a data structure built that we use and we have a profile, and that profile is tied to all that information, it will reduce the conflict. So I always try to be careful. If I'm doing a data model, I always call it a business view data model or business data model, or even don't say data model, um, business view of data and relationships. And then I keep saying, this is not the model. This is not the structure. I'm diagramming this so that you can see what the business believes is the relationships and constraints between the data. Like, do I have one-to-one, -one, one to many? That's key, because that will blow up a system. Am I going to support multiple addresses, phone numbers, whatever? Um, I saw a project at a bank go three years because they couldn't support multiple phone numbers. And the effort it took to change the model without breaking every system was horrendous. So they decided to build a parallel system to manage customer information and migrate everyone over to. And over three years, we were maintaining two systems and trying to get the data to match up with never matched. So depending on which system you looked at at which time in the day, your information was different. <laughs> yep. But the database modelers that we have, data yep. administrators, should not complain if you're giving them, giving them pieces of information on an installment basis. They should not complain. If you have built trust with them and they understand your intent, you're right. They, they should be happy. If they're not happy, then you have not built trust or they, you have now stepped in their domain yeah. and now they're taking offense. So if, if you... If I gave you information and I told you, here's how you're going to do your data model, you would probably get upset with me because that's your job. That's your value. That's your purpose. If you understand that I'm giving you a structure of data we need incorporated so that you can build the model and then I'll see if it passes business sanity and help explain that, then that's where you build the trust. But you, it's like you can never tell an artist, like if you tell an artist, well, I really think you should draw this way. Oh, man, they get mad. Um, but, and, and that's a big problem because an artist is creative. They take a lot of pride in their work. You can't tell them how to do something. So it's the same thing. You've got to build trust. But I love data models. I love diagrams. Anything that you work, come up with a, and tell them up ahead of time. So before you hand something off, you don't hand something off and explain it. You say, listen, we've got these stories. There's some business information, some data that we're going to need to collect. I know you've got to figure out how to put it in the model. Would it help if I could take this data and list it out and where I knew there were relationships, how would that work? What would be a format? Do you have a template? Do you have a way of looking at it? Like, would it help if I put this into a table or a spreadsheet? Would it help if I put it into an outline? Would you rather see it in a Visio diagram? What if I put it in the ERD tool? I know how to use the ERD tool. What if I created a business view of the data and then you could translate that to the real physical model. So that's how I would, I would build that trust ahead of time. Because then people know what to expect. You're giving them something right. And pull them in at the beginning of the project. Hey, when we get to the data part, it's going to be a month from now. But I'm going to need your help. So if you tell me the best way, give me examples. Like what's the best information you ever were handed for building a data model? Tell me what that is. And I'll try and come up with something like that. So if you can communicate the way somebody intends, then you're going to build trust, build that relationship. It's going to be a lot easier. Yes? Um, if we're going to do more um, analysis than just the user story, are we going to put more times in the backlog building session so that the team can get together to do more analysis? And then how are we going to deal with that? Um, so what would you say? What would you recommend? Um, 
we also talk about with Sprint Zero or that earlier Sprint. We can do some of the work over there with yep. the analysts, with the users, and do more of those analysis. But in the, in the same time, during the backup moving, there are there are things coming up that are well, included, and we should do more. So yep. we should build in those as part of the task. Yeah. So you've got overlapping sprints. So you've got this grooming and prioritization. Here's where I'm doing my doc, where I'm figuring out what to do. Then I'm building and testing it. And while I'm building and testing it, I'm coming up with the next bit of work. In that block of work, you're doing analysis in both blocks. And that's got to feed into the process. So part of it is within that cycle, you've got to acknowledge that you're doing the work. That's got to be part of your points estimate. Now you could call it out. So if you're in a team where they really need to know, you're gonna then you could call out those analysis techniques, assign points to them, and plan them into each sprint. Or if you're in a team that is a little hesitant, instead just add the points to say, well, we're going to divide this piece in this sprint, and now it's and you just assign an extra point to it because you know there's going to be a lot of analysis work. So really that's kind of cultural within your team and how your team wants to work. And don't be afraid to try new things. If you want to get to the point where you're calling it out separately because it has value and importance, then slowly start to introduce that. Introduce little mini analysis points that get into the scope saying, well, let's break this down. Let's be discreet. Let's break this down into two parts. I've got two points on the analysis and then I'm going to do three points on the stories that come out of that, and that will lead into the development cycle. You've now taken five points, broken into two, and then you can start doing that, and they're like, wow, that was really helpful, because then we knew not to expect until the later half of that spring. Absolutely, great, great point. And the, the sad part is, there's no right answer. Like, the right answer is, there's a thousand ways to do it. Try and guess the right way, or try and guess a good way, and if it works, keep doing it. If it's not working, stop. Yes? That ends up being organizational, wherever you can sneak it in. Um, so, in general, every artifact, every requirement type that I would do in a waterfall project, I would do in an agile project as well. I would even call them the same things, probably. But that's me because I don't fully adopt agile. So, renaming them may help. So, what I would say is, as you start this, if you come up with a model and suggest how you're going to document certain things and give them names, then they become part of it. You can trace it. If you're doing a system, then, like the system already has this built. So if you're doing, I won't speak to Rally and Jira as much, but if you're using a requirements management system that actually manages from an agile story standpoint, all of the supporting artifacts, well, a simplified version of supporting artifacts are already there. You've got to have non-functions. Your functionals kind of fall into that gray area where you may say, okay, these are the system requirements or system constraints. You can call them constraints instead of requirements. Um, that's one way of doing it. Um, your data models, data entities, that information, um, really whatever your team would accept. And so, I, so one story on that. When I first joined the bank, um, we were doing a very, very simple project, which was upgrading online banking. So the simple project was we're replacing 100% of the hardware, upgrading all of the operating systems, including database, technologies, everything. All the middleware was being updated to the latest .NET version. Oh, and let's go ahead and completely change the UI and also the flows in nine months with no baseline requirements. No requirements at all. There was one person who knew how everything worked. You just had to get her time and ask her so she could tell you. So the first thing I figured out was, we need to break this system down into the separate things you do, the different stories. I can transfer money, I can check deposits, I can open accounts. All of these things you do in online banking today and take for granted, each one of those is kind of a story. That story has steps that I have to complete. Each step has information I need. So for me, it was going to be screen-based. 
each section of the system, each story, was a section of the document. I was going to break it down into the number of steps by screen and then what the screens needed to do, because that would then tell the middleware team the data and the rules and the processing that would need to happen to get it back to the mainframe systems. So I looked at the requirement specification template they had, and it's stuck. One of the worst ones I've ever seen. And so, you know, it was pretty, very, formatting was very pretty. But other than that, the, it was just garbage. There was no content in their content. It was really anemic. So what I did was, I was like, we don't need to do this business requirements document and functional requirements document. We need to do a system requirements specification. Like, it's much more detailed. And here's how it breaks out. Here's the information. Here's where the data model is going to come in. Here's how all this thing is. The team hated it. They were furious. They're like, we don't do that here. That's not how it works. This is ridiculous. I don't know what you're doing. No, we're not doing that. I'm like, but this is the only way. Like, I've done projects. This has to be done. There's got to be analysis here. And they wouldn't do it. So finally, I went to the delivery manager, told them the exact same story, and she stared at me. And I was like, are you stupid? <laughs> I was like, I didn't think so before then, but now I'm starting to wonder. And she's like, listen, go back and try this. Take your content, put it in so that it has the same file name, the same document name, leave the title page alone, leave the signature and authorization page alone, and put your content, content into that template and stop trying to change what everyone's doing. I was like, that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Went back to the next team meeting. I said, team, you're right. I reconsidered it. We are going to do a business requirements document and a system, uh, and a functional requirements document. And here's what the content's going to look like. So, and just walk through the same content, but in that wrapper. And they're like, this is perfect. Okay, how soon can we start? I was like, I, I don't get it. But for them, the name, the title, they knew that you did certain things. They didn't know why you did them or what the content meant, so they didn't care about the cuts. They just cared that it had the right name. It's kind of like, am I pushing a stroller or a pram? Some people get offended if you use the wrong term. I don't know why. It's a baby mover. It rolls. You try not to tip them over. I, I just don't get it. So I'd say that's where the organization context needs to come in is a lot of people take pride in names or the structure. So as you're building this out, what do you call it? You call it whatever they'll accept. Just don't change the title page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in, my, in my organization, to speak to that a little bit, um, we did a transformation to Agile, and, and you know, I had business analysts on the team that were used to creating, you know, the 100-page requirements document, and they were just like, "Oh my God, how do I, you know, not, how do I do my job without creating this document?" And, you know, we had to stress to them, it's not about zero documentation. It's about minimal documentation. So yes. minimize it. To, yeah. So do documentation if you need it, but maybe. You don't have to do that 100 page requirement document. Maybe it's a spreadsheet or something else. And you've hit one of the most important things, and I think it's a, a great thing to close on. A lot of us are document or process or compliance zombies. We have been beaten into our organization to do certain things certain ways and fill in the blanks, and we don't get in trouble for filling in the blanks. When we try and create our own blanks or do them a different way, we often get in trouble. So we've learned that. Fitting in is the best way to go along, not standing out in the crowd. So if you can, um, so the cultural change with your teams, and this is where Agile is struggling, and understanding it's not the process, it's not the document. The document doesn't have value. It's the parts of the document that have value. So yes, there's going to be a document or a system or something that's going to look like that. But we want to focus in on the real value. It's the discrete requirements. It's these pieces. And that's what's important. And that's a cultural change in the organization. And if you can be one of the drivers to help them understand and get from thinking in terms of documents to requirements, that is an extremely valuable skill set. My whole role where I'm at now is to help companies go from being document and process zombies to requirements maturity, where they're viewing the value of discrete requirements and managing them as a baseline, managing them as an asset, using them to drive down risk in the organization. So I think that's a fabulous way to, to kind of close this out, and, and I'm, I'm glad that you're driving that in your organization. So in order to fulfill my promise in our original user story that we will be able to meet everyone to the buffet line, 
Um, we'll end two minutes early. I will be around for a few minutes um, to answer any other questions. Um, if you did not get a uh, cell phone stand, there's a couple here, and you can steal the ones I'm using with my cards. Um, thank you so much for coming. Please fill out your evaluations. Remember, any bad feedback goes to Cole, not me, so I'm really not worried. And thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the day.